phase two. What will our church be like in our new building? You know, people wonder, is the church going to be the same? Will it feel the same? And uh, I always answer, no, it will not be the same. It's going to be better. And I'll tell you how I know it's going to be better. The Lord has already shown me that it's going to be better. Um, for the last few years, there's been something going on with me that I find a little troubling. The Lord has been speaking to me more and more in dreams. And uh, the things, many of the things that I've dreamed have happened. Some of them are happening now. Uh, of course, it's a good thing that the Lord is speaking to me, but it troubles me that he's speaking to me in dreams because there's a verse in the Bible that says, your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. So I don't know what the Lord is trying to say to me that I'm dreaming. And Dom had a vision and he's older than me. I don't get it, but... Thank God, whether it's by visions or dreams or gifts of the Holy Spirit or through the Word of God, we worship a living God who speaks. I do missions in a part of the world where people spend hours and hours and hours on their knees bringing offerings of gold to statues that have eyes that are painted on and mouths that are painted on. They can't see, they can't hear, they can't speak, but we worship a living God who sees us and hears us and who speaks to us. Since 2013, I've had three significant dreams about phase two. The most recent one was just a couple days before my 50th birthday in September. And if you'll permit me, I want to share the dream with you and I want to share the interpretation that the Lord gave me. In my dream, we were getting ready to hold the very first service in phase two. It was nighttime. People were starting to enter the sanctuary and they were seeing it for the very first time completed. Everyone was very excited. There was a lot of buzz. There was a lot of joyful anticipation in the atmosphere. There was a very large crowd coming from this sanctuary uh, and entering from this building into the new sanctuary from this side. And I saw through the main front door and through the door on the far side a lot of new people, very large crowd of new people that I've never seen before coming in. Everyone was... Uh, looking around trying to figure out where they want to sit, you know, try to stake their claim. You know you all sit in the same seats every week? Do you know you do that? And if you really want to mess with my head, just move seats because that's how I look around. I know where you sit. I look for you. And if I don't see you, then I know that you're not in church. Everybody was, was uh, uh, finding their seats. And I had picked out the colors for the sanctuary myself, and so I was kind of nervously uh, waiting to see what people's reactions would be. And the colors were incredibly vivid. The walls were covered with these rose-colored curtains that were very bright, very vivid, intense, rich. The fabric was shimmering. It was hanging in swags like old-fashioned theater curtains. And the seats were uh, what I would call a steel blue color. Again, uh, very, very intense, vivid, the colors. And while everyone was uh, looking around at the colors and finding their seats, I left and I went back to my office to greet the guest speaker. He came in through the French door in my office. The guest speaker was a Messianic Jewish rabbi. He was very tall. He had thick black hair. He had a full beard. He had a beautiful, perfect smile. He was very famous. And he and I were very close friends. We greeted each other with a hug, and I presented him a very large offering check. And I was joyful to give him this large check. Now, normally, when we have guest speakers, we give them the check after they've preached all the services, just in case they say something stupid along the way, and then we knock off a little bit. No, we don't do that. But we, we, we give them the offering at the end. But I presented him the offering check as soon as he came through the door. And that's where the dream ended. When I awoke, it was morning. You know, when the Lord speaks to us, whether it's in a prophetic word, whether it's through a vision, a dream, uh, we have to pray into it. We have to get the interpretation from the Lord. I shared the dream with our pastors. I shared it with some of our intercessors here at Harvest Time. I shared it with our friends Brian and Candace Simmons. 
Candace in particular has a gift from the Lord for interpreting dreams. And she sent me some feedback on the meaning of some of the symbols. And when she did, the Lord just downloaded to me the interpretation of the dream. What will our church be like in our new building? I believe that there's five things that the Lord has shown me. I'm going to give them to you just quickly this morning. What will our church be like in phase two? Five things the Lord has shown me. Number one, we are going to be a family that experiences spiritual and numeric growth. Spiritual and numeric growth. You know, ever since I was first saved at the age of eight, I have always been part of ministries that have flourished in growth. I've always been part of movements and churches that were large and that were growing. Now, we were always part of home Bible studies. We were always part of small discipleship groups. And I believe that those are absolutely critical to our growth in Christ, to discipleship. But those groups were always part of a, a larger corporate body that was thriving and growing. When I served on the staff of my home church after Bible college, it was a large church, and we baptized 20 to 30 new believers every month at my home church. You know, I'm so happy when we move into phase two. For the first time in 34 years, we're going to have a baptistry in our sanctuary. And so we're going to be able to baptize people. Sometimes, often, we have people who come to us in the winter months, and they want to take baptism. And I say, well, you're going to have to just wait a little bit for things to warm up. But I'm so thankful that we're going to be able to do baptisms in our new building whenever we have that need. But because I always was part of larger churches, it's, it's always mystified me why there are some who spiritualize smallness and demonize largeness. You know, over the 20 years that we've been working on this, all of the pushback that I've received from building a big sanctuary has been from Christians. The people in the community that I talk to are excited about the fact that the church is growing, but I've had to face some resistance from Christians. Yet I notice that when Christians go to conferences, prophetic conferences and worship conferences and concerts and special services, I notice that those are always held in big buildings. And we're going to be able to do some of those things right here at Harvest Time. We already have Randy Clark scheduled for next fall in phase two. If you don't no, Randy, he is, was the leader of the Toronto uh, blessing outpouring that happened in the 1990s. You know, Jesus said that growth is programmed into the kingdom of God. The kingdom starts out as the tiniest of seeds and it grows into a tree where many find refuge. The kingdom starts out as the tiniest pinch of yeast, but it rapidly spreads and it changes everything everywhere it goes. Beloved, listen, there is nothing inherently spiritual about smallness, nor is there anything inherently carnal about bigness. When there is quality in the kingdom, it always produces quantity. Jesus also said that what he expects from us is fruitfulness, specifically the fruit of winning new believers to him. You know, Hebrew says that Jesus is bringing many sons to glory. Paul says that the gift of salvation that comes by the grace of the one man, Jesus, overflows to many. In phase one, we don't have many seats. That's why we have so many services. But in phase two, we'll have many seats, so we don't have to do quite so many services, at least not at first. I'm up for doing four services a weekend with a thousand people in each one. I know it's a little counterintuitive, but a bigger building is actually going to help us to become a closer knit family. Right now, the Saturday night people don't know the Sunday morning people. The 8.30 people don't know the 10 o'clock people. The 10 o'clock people don't know the 11.30 people. And it's a shame because you're the best looking bunch out of all of them. <laughs> I didn't say that in the other services. I promise you. Even if you wanted to stay around and fellowship between services, you know, there's no place to do that. We anticipate having two Sunday morning services in the new building with a space in between so that we can pray for people at the altar who have a need and who want prayer and so that you can fellowship and enjoy each other a little bit. I don't know whether you've been downstairs yet. We're going to take you in there in just a couple of weeks, but the, the lower level is cavernous. 
the fellowship hall is a room bigger than this one, and there's going to be a coffee bar down there so that you could just stay in fellowship and you can just uh, enjoy each other a little bit. Many people have commented while the building has been going up that it reminds them a bit of a barn. And you know, that's exactly what it is. It is a barn for end time harvest. What will our church be like in phase two? Five things the Lord has shown me. Spiritual and numeric growth. Secondly, we're going to be a congregation of passionate worship. Accessing the heavenly realms and entering the glory of the Lord. We're going to have what I'm going to call rose-colored worship. The most prominent feature of my dream by far was the colors on the walls and on the seats. And I believe those shimmering rose-colored curtains speak of the worship experiences that we're going to have in phase two. By, by the way, these are not the colors we're putting in phase two, okay? I just, I just want to reassure you, all right? It's, it's symbolic, all right? It's just symbolic, all right? Uh, I believe that they symbolize the worship that we're going to have. From my friend Candace Simmons, I discovered that the Hebrew word for rose, Shoshana, some of you might recognize that name. It means rose. It comes from one of the Hebrew words for worship, sus. It means delight, rejoicing, celebration. So the, the root uh, word to rose in Hebrew is the delight, the celebration, the rejoicing of worship. It's used in a very personal way to describe the intimate joy shared between two people. In the Song of Songs, it's described, used to describe the delight between the bridegroom and his bride, who are Jesus and his church. David used this word for worship, this rose word for worship, when he said, Then my soul will rejoice in the Lord and delight in his salvation. Isaiah used that same word when he said, As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so God will rejoice over you. There, it's used in that uh, famous verse, you know, in Zephaniah 317, the Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will rejoice over you with joyful shouting. He will quiet you in his love. I believe that the rose colored curtain symbolize worship that comes from being passionately in love with Jesus. It's the soulful delight of a young couple in love. It's the rejoicing in heart of a young groom and a bride. Curtains are also symbolic of entering in. In the tabernacle, priests entered through curtains into the holy place and then into the holy of holies. Hebrews said that there are curtains that separate the heaven and the earth. And Jesus has gone ahead of us. He's gone through that curtain and is now in the presence of the Lord interceding for us. And when we gather for worship in his name, we are transported into that realm. We go through the curtains into his presence. We experience exactly what Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Let your kingdom come. Oh, do you know the Lord's Prayer? Let your kingdom come. Let your will be on as it is in heaven. You see, not only does God inhabit the praises of his people, God is enthroned on the praises of his people. When we're gathered for worship in the name of Jesus, the authority of heaven descends upon us. The order of heaven descends upon us. Beloved, sickness cannot stay in that kind of atmosphere. Spirits of death cannot stay in that kind of atmosphere. Oppression, depression, Obsessions cannot stay where Jesus is Lord. Addictions cannot stay where Jesus is Lord. Generational curses and spirits of poverty cannot stay where Jesus is Lord. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Here's what I know in my spirit about phase two. The worship in that auditorium is going to be glorious. What will our church be like in phase two? Five things. Spiritual and numeric growth. Rose-colored worship, if you will. Number three, we're going to be a congregation of heavenly resolve. Along with those rose-colored walls, the other prominent feature of the dream was the seats, which were steel blue in color. And everyone was finding his or her place and planting themselves in their seat. You know, I believe that symbolizes heavenly resolve. Beloved, I want to tell you that we are living in the last days 
that Jesus and the New Testament warned us about. The love of many has grown cold. Men are falling away from the faith. Many have itching ears and they pursue teachers who teach what suits their own desires. But the cry of my heart is that harvest time will cling tenaciously to the truth of the gospel and to the eternal truth of the word of God. The cry of my heart is that we will not reject God's truth, but that we will be lovers of his truth. Listen to me. There are not many paths to eternal life. There is only one way, and his name is Jesus. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. My prayer is that we will cling with heavenly resolve to the truth of the word of God. The cry of my heart is that we will always uphold the sanctity of life. The cry of my heart is that we will always uphold the sanctity of marriage as a divinely ordained union between one man and one woman. The cry of my heart is that we will always tenaciously cling to the dignity of God's assignment of male and female to people in the womb. I didn't get enough amens there. I, I, you look better than 8, 30, and 10, but they amen better than you. I'm just telling you. In the new year, the Lord has put on my heart to do the most important series I believe we've ever done here. All of our pastors are going to help me team teach it, and it's about having a Christian worldview. It's about having... It's about having a Christian mindset, a Christian perspective on ourselves, on our culture. Beloved, listen to me. Our culture is seriously depraved. It is going down the tubes. I don't mean to be discouraging, but that's the truth. We're coming up to those verses in Romans that say, don't be conformed to the image of this world, but be how? By the renewing of your mind. I'm deeply concerned that we're losing our kids. And we're not losing them in college anymore like we used to. We're losing them by middle school. The schools and our depraved culture is winning and we are losing our kids. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is destruction. The end of it is heartbreak and regret here on earth and separation from God forever in eternity. Paul pleads with us, set your heart on things above. Set your affections on things above. Set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. I believe that the steel blue seats and everyone finding their place and being planted in their seats symbolizes heaven's resolve. Clear and deeply held Christian convictions. Holy courage like Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego like Daniel had in Babylon. It mattered that they didn't bow to Nebuchadnezzar's image. And it matters that we don't bow to the gods of our culture either. That's good preaching right there. You know, it's taken us 20 years to build this. What will the next generation do with phase two? We're going to focus all of our efforts on preparing our kids and our teenagers and our young adults to engage their culture and their world with the truth of the gospel. And it begins with every one of us having a personal encounter with the beautiful person of Jesus. What will our church be like in phase two? Five things the Lord has shown me. Spiritual and numeric growth. Rose-colored worship, if you will. Heavenly resolve. Number four, we're going to be a safe haven in demonically ferocious times. For the last several months, I've been walking around inside the new sanctuary and praying. If you haven't been inside yet, I want to tell you, it is spectacular. I was a little nervous, to be honest, when the building started going up. 
you know, especially from the outside, because that roof line, you know, when it was it, when it was started going up, I'm like, man, this is funky. It's like it's it's wild looking. Uh, I love it, uh, but I, I wasn't sure whether I was going to like it. But I want to tell you, when you go inside that sanctuary and you look up, it is absolutely spectacular. We didn't plan it this way, but the new building is shaped exactly from overhead. It, I need somebody with a drone and a camera to go up and, and get me a shot. Because if you go up and you look straight down on the building, it looks exactly like a dove. The beak points to King Street, and the tail is the covered entry here facing the parking lot. And the roof of the sanctuary are the two wings. And so when I go out and pray in the new sanctuary, I call it being under his wings. I want to tell you the presence of the Lord is already there. It prays good. It's good praying out there. We're going to take you all out there. Uh, the building committee doesn't know that yet, but they know it now. Uh, <laughs> The Sunday before Christmas, we're all going to go on a little walking tour. We're going to show you the upstairs and the downstairs so you can just see it. But Paul wrote about these times in which we live. He said, but mark this, in the last days, terrible times will come. You know, that word terrible is the same word that Matthew used to describe the ferocity of the Gadarene demoniac. It says he was exceedingly fierce. It's the same word that Paul uses when he says terrible times. In the last days, demonically ferocious times will come. People will be lovers of themselves. We don't see that, do we? <laughs> lovers of money. Boastful. Proud. Disobedient to their parents. We don't see that, do we? Ungrateful. Unholy without self-control, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Beloved, these are the times in which we live. I saw that it was already nighttime when we gathered for that first service in phase two, but I want to tell you that in here we are under the shadow of his wings. In phase two, we're going to be surrounded by the curtains of his presence and we're going to be seated in his heavenly authority. David said, in the time of trouble, he will hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. Every Tuesday morning, our staff prays for you and this is what we pray. We pray that whatever bad is happening out there, precisely the opposite will happen in here. If families are unraveling out there, we pray that families will be knit back together in here. If people are confused about their sexuality out there, we pray that they will discover wholeness in Christ in here. If addiction is spiraling out of control out there, we pray that in here people will abound in the beautiful fruit of the Spirit that is self-control. As our culture grows sicker and sicker, we pray that the kingdom counterculture in here would grow healthier and healthier. What will our church be like in phase two? Five things. Spiritual and numeric growth. Rose-colored worship, if you will. Heavenly resolve. A safe haven. And finally this. Worship team, you can come help me finish. We're going to lavish our worship on Jesus, especially the worship of our generous giving. We're going to lavish worship on him. And one way we worship is through our giving. The Messianic rabbi that came to my door was none other than Jesus himself. We greeted one another and we were close friends. And the Lord spoke a very precious personal word to me. And then he spoke a word about you. He said to me that my office as your pastor and my friendship with Jesus was going to create the doorway through which his presence was going to fill our new building. My intimate friendship with Jesus is going to create here at Harvest Time that, that atmosphere of security and resolve and rest and joyfulness and heavenly worship and access to heavenly realms and spiritual encounters and it's going to create an atmosphere of kingdom generosity. The check that I had to present to Jesus was your offerings. And the sense that I had about it is that it was like that alabaster box of precious perfume 
that the forgiven woman lavished on Jesus. Beloved, listen to me. Phase two is our corporate offering to Jesus. Phase two is our alabaster box of precious perfume, the costly sacrifice of our worship lavished on Jesus. Now I know every time a pastor gets in the pulpit and talks about money, there's somebody out there saying, there they go. That's all the church wants is your money. That's all the pastor wants is your money. You know, we've raised over 20 years over $10 million to build this building. Now we're building that one and none of that money has gone to me. When we leave here, when God calls us on, everything we've built stays here with you. In fact, while we were building this building, my wife and I received a couple of inheritances very unexpectedly and we gave those inheritances into this building. So our sacrifices are sown into this building just as much as yours are. That's not my notes, but somebody needed to hear that today. This is our offering to Jesus. I want to tell you, it's a spectacular building, and I believe it ought to be to give glory to a spectacular Savior who gave himself for us. Generosity is the culture of God's kingdom because generosity is the nature of our great King himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus he who did not spare his own son but offered him up for us freely how will he not also together with Jesus freely give us all things you see generosity is the nature and the heart of our great king and so it is the culture of his kingdom we've been working on phase two since 1997 over 10 million that we've raised over all those years and now we are only $800,000 away from worshiping in our new sanctuary. We are so close. As soon as the sanctuary is finished, we'll get a temporary certificate of occupancy. We'll begin worshiping in it. We can use all of this building and the new sanctuary and we'll finish up the lower level over a little bit of time as the Lord continues making provision. But we're just this close from being able to move into our new building. In your bulletin today, there's a response card. And I wonder if very quickly, you just take that response card and look at it with me. Right now, we are praying for two lead gifts of $80,000 each. I know that sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money. But you know, the biggest gift that we have had so far to Harvest Time was $750,000. $80,000 one for the upper level, 80,000 for the lower level. If I had 100 people, that could give $8,000 each, that would be $800,000. If I had 1,000 people, that could give $800 each, that would be $800,000. We have over 1,000 people who worship here at harvest time. Now 300 something of those are kids. So probably most kids don't have $800 to give. However, there are some times, Denise and I find, that our kids have more money in the bank than we do on a given week. So it's pretty pathetic when you have to bum 20 bucks. You know, they always wait. They always wait till like the school morning uh, to tell you, oh yeah, I need to take like $20 or $40 into school for this or that, right? And you know, you got nothing left. My poor Maddie, she's the one. We, we bum from her every time to, to, oh yeah, I need 20 bucks for this or that. So this is what Denise and I are praying. We're praying that we can give $800 for each member of our family. We have a family of five. Maybe you can use eight as your inspiration. Eight is the number of new beginnings. But this is what we want to ask you to do. We simply want to ask you to take this response card home. We want to ask you to pray over it and ask the Lord what you can do to help us reach this first $800,000 so that we can move into our new sanctuary and begin worshiping there. I want to say very clearly, and please uh, hear me, if you have a pledge to the Jump In campaign, whatever you give uh, towards this $800,000 will be counted towards the pledge that you've made. Many of you have been giving, you don't have a pledge, but you've just been giving, bless you, and so you can give that way. But if you have a pledge that you're still working on, whatever you give in response to this, 
uh, it'll go towards your pledge. So would you pray about what you can do? Would you pray about making a gift before the end of this year, if it's possible? Um, for tax purposes, if you want credit for giving in 2016, we have to receive your gifts by December 31st. But it just so happens this year that Christmas falls on a Sunday. And so maybe Christmas Eve, maybe Christmas Sunday is a day that you'd like to bring your gift for our new sanctuary. Uh, the week before that, we're going to take a tour together. We're going to see the upstairs and the downstairs of phase two. And uh, maybe that would be a good week to bring your gift. But all we're asking is that you take this home, pray, and ask the Lord, what can I do? 800, 8,000, some multiple of eight, uh, a lead gift. Lord, what can I do to help build the sanctuary? Would you stand together with me this morning? Let's just...